another exciting episode of the Flapcast Behind the Funny, where we find out what goes on behind the scenes at a comedy club. You just rub your butt on me? I'm Barbara Holliday. I'm the owner of Flappers and the Booker. Okay, that's... Like uh, finally turned off Josh's mic. I was perfect. wondering when you were right. going to do that. I love it. And our Typical. special guest, headliner DJ Demers. Hey, pleasure. Fresh from Conan O'Brien, Fresh. actually. I still that's have right. Conan's scent all over me. Thursday night, he had a Conan appearance. How exciting is that? How Was, was it exciting? I'm running tech while I'm talking to you. I'm Ooh, sorry. Multifaceted. Yeah, I want to make sure our theme doesn't play again. How was Conan? Good. Yeah? Yeah. Just good? That's all we have to say about being on Conan? You know, I'm very self-critical. Okay. So This was your second appearance mm -hmm. on Conan O'Brien. Your first appearance was about two years ago, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And that's all you have to say about it? Really? About the first one or the most <laughs> recent one? What do you want to know? Either one. I want to know what it feels like to be out there. And Tell us about your pro. Tell us the journey. The, the journey. journey. Well, in my mind, um, the journey is the destination. Which is why it's so weird once you reach the destination, because you're like, oh, so now what am I supposed to feel? Because uh. the journey was like, I knew I got the spot, so it was like a month of me really trying to hone that five minutes, which you saw. You saw me doing sets here at Flappers. And uh, that was really fun, but then once I actually finished it, I just wanted to like, do so well, and I'm just so self-critical. So I, I feel good. It was a fun appearance, and it was amazing being back on Conan, of course. Um, it's just a weird, like, kind of come down afterwards. Like, the, en right. the endorphins kind of settle down. You're like, I need a little bit more time to analyze if I feel great about that or merely okay with it. So for a lot of people listening, they mm -hmm. have no idea what you're talking about. I did a five-minute set on Conan O'Brien last Thursday, and I must reiterate before I get all neurotic and into my own insecurities, <laughs> it was an amazing honor. It was a great show. It was my second time, so it was really special to me. And um, yeah, and uh, my girlfriend came along, Barbara, you were there, uh, Mark Scrog. Why was uh, I there? Because you're my manager. Uh, oh, yeah, nobody knows. I just take it for granted that people know <laughs> this whole dynamic. Barbara, you're my manager. Well, I am. You are. Are you still I my manager? You're just telling me now? <laughs> you're my manager, <laughs> I better Barbara. get to work. Like it or not, you're managing me. <laughs> okay, boy, this is a big plate of stuff. <laughs> I got I have paperwork to deal with. here with me. <laughs> All right, so I'm, I have to sign now? <laughs> not now. We'll wait until after. Well, DJ, you know, originally came to us uh, from Canada. Mm -hmm. and now he's... A Somebody dropped me off on your doorstep, <laughs> knocked on the door and ran away. Came to an audition, actually, at Flappers Comedy Club. That's right. Yeah, right here on this very Three stage. years ago, I think. Yeah, I think more. I think it was like four, four years ago now. Gosh, yeah. has it been that long? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and came he here on a Tuesday night, did a three-minute set. And, and, and uh, now here we are. Yeah. You like... Well, you weren't there that night. Dave, your partner, was here. And then he told you, I think, the next night to come watch me. And you did. And then I actually didn't have that great of a set that night. Well, he said, there's a comedian you should see. He's hard of hearing. Mm -hmm. And he talks about it. And he's got great presence and confidence. And I told him to come back tomorrow, Barb, so you can see him. I told him to do the same set. So he's going to give you exactly what you want. And then I came to the audition. And uh, you said nothing about being hard of hearing. No. Uh, it, was in, <laughs> it was my mindset that I was like, oh, I'm going to show, I did hearing aid stuff last night. Now tonight I'll show them that I'm not a one-trick pony. And now I'll show them my other amazing non-hearing aid material, which I think ended up being about like, I think it was a bathroom joke. I think it was talking about pooing on a toilet or something. So I don't know what my thinking was, but I believe I've evolved since then. Um, but yeah, so that was four years ago, and then... I ended up uh, somehow seeing something in that uh, <laughs> yeah. poop material, yeah. I guess. That somehow I you saw the through colleges. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and then Definitely. you started uh, booking she me for colleges. Hmm? She saw the gold. the gold. Yeah, saw the gold. Yeah, the yeah. golden nugget. Um, and then, yeah, you were, my, you were sending me out to colleges, and then eventually last year after I was on America's Got Talent, or before America's Got yeah, Talent... way before America's Got Talent. You started managing me. And well, so with, we with the Conan set, I mm. think you're probably someone that um, a lot of new comedians listen to this podcast, I think, um, specifically. And they always wonder, you know, how is the process? And mm -hmm. when I tell them, they don't believe me. So you need to tell them. How 
many times you sent your set to the booker and how many notes you got on it and how you had to you yeah. finish the so, story for me. Yeah, I feel a lot of people, comedians or just regular people, uh, <laughs> civilians, if you will, uh, cool. they think you just show up and you do whatever five minutes you want. And that's not the way it works at all. Of course, you, uh, the booker says, hey, I saw this set that you did. I like that. Can you get it on tape and send it to me? Then you send it, and then he or she says, uh, actually, let's get rid of this third joke. Can you change the way you say that first joke? Uh, make sure you end on this joke because we're going to go to the music cue right after you say this line. So once you've actually committed to a particular five minutes with the show, you're locked into that set. So from that point on, you're just trying to hone that particular five minutes that has already been approved, tighten it up, fine tune it. But that is the five minutes you're doing. So I knew the five I was going to do on Conan probably about a month and a half before I was actually... And how many times do you think you practiced it? Oh, man, I practiced it. Well, I have a, a good friend, um, Ron Jossel. He's a great comedian. And he told me the first time I did Conan, because I was living in Toronto at the time, and sometimes I would get up and do the five I was supposed to be doing, and then other times, to keep my brain limber, I would do some other set, just to, uh, you know, so I didn't feel like I was too locked into that set. And he, Ron, was like, no. You do that set so often you hate it that you just like it becomes a part of your fiber of your being so that when you actually get onto that stage, you don't have to worry about any of the memorization. You can focus on being 100% in the moment. So this time and the first time actually I took his advice, but this time really the last month and a half uh, with your help as well, you've been giving me a lot of stage time here at Flappers. Uh, I've ran that set probably over the last month. I probably did that five minutes. 60 times, I'd say. Yeah. yeah. And then we were even tweaking words at the very last minute. Yeah, the night before we tweaked a but couple it words. Worked. It did work, yeah. And, and, you know, I like a couple little tweaks like that last minute because it does force you to get out of autopilot. Hmm. You, you're like, oh, I have to make sure I make this little change. So I do like doing that. Not too much of a change because then that yeah. can throw everything off. Yeah, but. you can't change the whole structure or the joke. But. Yeah. But it's crazy, man. Even being there before, I was a lot more aware of what the process was. But once they open those curtains and you walk out, you're like, oh, <laughs> oh, here I am. And the audience set up, they're far away from you. They're behind cameras. And that's another thing that's different. Is in a, a club setting, I like to talk to people. I like to really feel that connection. And um, in the studio setting, it's kind of, you have to fabricate. You have to make it feel like there's a connection. Uh, to the cameras especially, but it's virtually impossible to actually bridge that divide. There's literally, there's cameras separating you from the audience. And weird, awkward silences. Yeah. That, like anytime you're recording for TV or radio, you always have that weird delay. Yeah. That makes you feel uncomfortable, but it doesn't mm -hmm. sound uncomfortable to the audience. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole show that has already been taped before yeah. you walked out there, so you have to be... You have no control over what the mood of the room is before you come out. So it's a very interesting animal, but it was, uh, I felt better the second time. I'd love to do it 20 more times. Did you at all? <laughs> Did you hear that, JP? <laughs> <laughs> That's the name of the if booker for Conan, just so. Shh, don't tell everyone. Well, okay. you said JP. <laughs> now they're wondering who JP, we didn't say any last name. Did you at all, at any point, did you uh, think about when and where you were looking at the camera or looking at the audience? So that, was that plotted out, or did you just kind of let that happen uh, naturally? Very good question, Josh. Um, it was plotted out. I had a line where I said, for Helen Keller, and I said, for... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, Barb's doing the hand motion here, because when I say, for Helen Keller... Um, that was actually a change me what it, we made the night before to bring my hands together and really emphasize the point. But I said full Helen Keller in my first Conan set as well. And I really wanted to make it clear to the audience that this was a callback to my first set. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make sure for that particular line I was looking right at the camera. Mm -hmm. Kind of looking into the living room of people at home and being like, yeah, I know that I've said this before and it was intentional. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, I just wanted to make sure I, um, I looked across the entire room um, but that was the only real intentional spot where I wanted to make sure I was looking right at the camera. Uh, but yeah, I did want to make sure I did that. And I feel like watching the set, it works well when you're looking right at the camera. If I do another late night spot, I think I'd probably try to make an effort to look at the cam like directly at the middle camera even more frequently.
Yeah. Well, you know what I love about DJ? Because I was there before, during, and after. And the great thing is he's you're such a normal human. Like, you don't freak out or get weird or you're able to have a normal conversation. You know, every comic has their own process. But I really appreciate that about you. It's like you're just very grounded. It's like, do you think in your head, like, this isn't, you know, life's not going to end after this? Or, like, you know how comics get so caught up? What's your coaching before something important like that how do you what do you do in your head that helps you get centered like that i think what you just said kind of nails it on the head i just know even if i had the worst set of my life i'm still alive <laughs> after it's done <laughs> what are you doing uh, you're alive. yeah yeah no for real like i'm still alive and this is well you actually mentioned it before the podcast started we were talking about somebody else but um you said a lot of people don't realize that they're like, oh, I have to really start to pursue this particular passion. But you are, like, you're in the middle of it. So while I was there, I was like, don't be nervous. You're doing Conan a second time. Like, this is it. This is this is a dream. You're doing it. So I just kind of try to keep a positive outlook and remember that comedy is supposed to be fun. I think all my worst sets I've ever had were where I forgot that this was supposed to be fun. And truth be told... I feel like that's why I don't love this set. I feel like there's an extra like 10% of fun that's missed. Like I, di I forgot that I'm, I, j I don't know. It's like almost where I want it to be, but I can just feel my, f my most fun sets are where I can feel that I'm just a silly guy having a fun time up there. Um, and so I would say that's part of my process, trying to remember, you know, you were there, my girlfriend, a lot of people that I, I really care about were in the room. So I'm like, this is part of the fun. It's not just those five minutes on stage. Very Enjoy sad. the whole thing. Yeah. So I want to dig deep into the disability angle mm -hmm. that you that you have to deal with day to day. So yeah. you're, you're, you've been d deaf since you were a young boy. Yeah, since probably since I was born. But I've been wearing hearing aids since I was four. Yeah. yeah, and when I first met you and I was talking about the the hearing disability, you were very adamant, like, ah, I don't, you know, you, there's a little bit of um, apprehension about talking about it, yet mm -hmm. when you talk about it, you get such a great response from the audience. Yeah. So how do you feel about that? And Well, you do a lot of jokes about a lot of, about life. It's not just about your hearing aid. So you're able to really give a a full picture of yourself, but you more than any other person that I've ever worked with that has a disability, you literally are a spokesperson for people with disabilities because you are deaf, but you act like everyone else, including mm. from stage to off and until you lose your hearing aids or <laughs> don't have your yeah, hearing aids yeah. in. Although then, yeah. it was interesting about that because the one night that he did lose it was the longest we've had a conversation. What, when he didn't have his hearing aids in? Correct. Yeah. So, but, I, can you enumerate, you know, uh, enumerate on this a little bit? Like, I'm, I'm curious how you feel. Like, does it bug you when I push you as a disabled comic or, you know? That question, also, just to go to Josh's point, I feel like you were like my safety blanket that <laughs> night. Cause I was they so don't know what happened. Yeah, I, I locked my hearing aids in Barb's garage. When <laughs> I first moved to L.A., she was nice enough to let me crash in her guest house. And I had two headlining sets here at the YooHoo Room and Flappers. And uh, I couldn't get my hearing aids. They were locked in the guest house. So I came and did two sets completely deaf, completely <laughs> deaf. And uh, in between sets, comics were trying to talk to me and stuff. And I was just like, I can't hear anybody. So I just kind of locked myself in the office here and hung out with Josh and uh, read his lips. I, I didn't hear you, but we had a conversation. I was reading his lips. And um, that was actually a really fun night for me because I've never, never mind performed, I've never even left my house without my hearing aids in. Wow. So I was like, okay, here, let's confront this. And I was new to LA. I mean, I'm in LA doing that. So uh, once I did that night, I was kind of like, oh, like, I don't know. That was a, a, a legitimate fear that I overcame. So that was a, a cool <laughs> night for me. Um, I so spent a lot of screaming that night. <laughs> <laughs> Were you talking extra loud? Well, I, I had to look directly at him yeah. and yeah. enunciate. And that's, of course, when we had, and that's the most we've talked, I think. Yeah. But you have, you have this ability to make people feel very comfortable. Like, I see your hearing aids, but I, I forget about them all the time. Hmm. And that's because you're such a cool guy. Well, thank you very much. But uh. it's, y it's you putting that out there. That's what I'm saying. Like, a lot of people could make a big deal about it. Yeah. But you don't. I guess to answer your question from before, I feel like... I still have the apprehension about just doing hearing aid material. 
not because I'm ashamed of them. That might have been more of a reason in the beginning. Now I'm not ashamed of them at all. I feel like I still have that apprehension because unless I can tap into something universal, like an emotion like shame or uh, whatever it happened to be, shyness, whatever it is, so somebody who doesn't wear a hearing aid can still feel some relatability to that joke, that's the only way I want to do a hearing aid joke. If it's just a joke that's purely about hearing aids that somebody who doesn't know that experience doesn't understand, then I feel like I've failed in, in my mission as a comedian. Um, so I feel like my hearing aid material does better if the audience senses that I'm more than just my hearing aid. So I don't mind doing my hearing aid material. I really like it when, I f when I've already done material that's not pertaining to that. So when I go into it, they're like, oh, it's, this is a part of who he is. It's not all he is. Um, but you have to address it. I have I mean, to, 100. And it's like, if I'm not going to talk about it, who is? It's like my experience. There's a lot of funny stuff that happens. So um, I, I don't feel any apprehension talking about it. And I feel like if I can be comfortable with it, then it can destigmatize it. Because, and this was never my goal when I started, but it's kind of become something I've realized as I've done it longer. There's so many people, there are so many people who wear hearing aids young people, old people, and I've even met like 70 year olds who say, oh, the doctor told me I have to wear a hearing aid, but I don't know, I'm kind of embarrassed. And I'm like, you're 70 years old, <laughs> you need hearing aids and you won't wear them. So for somebody to still be embarrassed by them at that age, it makes me realize that as a young, cool, uh, I put that in air quotes because you don't want to call yourself cool. That's not cool. But as a, a young, <laughs> relatively charismatic person to be free and comfortable to talk about my hearing aids that openly, there is a certain power in that. And you I don't want to run away from that. You know who needs hearing aids? Who? My employees! <laughs> Bada boom. Do we okay, have a anyway. drum roll here? No. All right, no sound effects yeah. today. Rim shot. Um, well, on on a positive note, one thing that has... Were, were the hearing aids not a positive note? No, note? they were <laughs> <laughs> Could you hear? But uh, no. <laughs> um, what I was going to say is you have a big tour coming up in the fall. What's been great is um, corporate events often ask you to uh, speak on behalf of, uh, I don't know if I can, I can mention Phonak, uh, one of the world's largest hearing aid manufacturers, has actually signed you on as an ambassador. That's right. So yeah. You Shout out to Phonak. What? I, I'm wearing Phonak right now. Can we see that? <laughs> <laughs> wow, I just saw what I looked like on the video. Zoom this guy's in. headed for the beach. Look at all the legs I'm showing here. Those Look are my there. legs. Oh, no. They're your legs, too. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Phonak. Phonak's been really good to me. I've been wearing them for Phonak. a long time. Yeah. And even this fall, they have signed you on to do a tour during October, which is Disability Awareness Month, mm -hmm. if you're listening. And you're going to be touring about 20 colleges and universities in the fall yeah. to raise awareness for uh, young people and any hearing impaired students is on campus. And I'm going to be blowing know? air horns into people's ears <laughs> so that they need hearing aids <laughs> after two. Trying to create more hard of hearing people is across America. Or out, is that uh, in the country or out of the country? In, in the, the country, United across States. America, yeah. Can I rent an RV? The and tour is called? Here to Hear. Comedy tour. Here to Hear With comedy D tour. D DJ's face will be on the side of a bus. I know. It's a very big ego builder. I've, I've always wanted my face on the side of a bus. And, and they'll be throwing go. out hearing aids. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to everyone. Giving them out. Having a parade, just throwing hearing aids at the peasants on the side no, of the Who's on the bus with you? A videographer. <laughs> a videographer and a bevy of supermodels. Hot chicks. A bevy. I've requested that. They yes. haven't gotten back to me on how that. Many are, how many all said no. How many are in a bevy? Uh, I asked them. <laughs> What's that? How many are in a bevy? A Is bevy, oh, that's a pretty ambiguous term, but I think upwards of seven. <laughs> I believe if I had to put a number on bevy, yeah. Upwards of seven gorgeous supermodels will be in the interview. Upwards me. of seven, okay. Yeah. So but, uh, we're going to be shooting some footage, actually, uh, of behind the scenes on the tour, so stay tuned okay. for that. It's going to be great. I've always wanted a dedicated videographer. Because whenever something cool happens, you're even like, now, <laughs> even though selfie culture is not as stigmatized, you're allowed to do it, I always feel weird. But if I always got a guy with a camera, oh, man, I'm going to use and abuse him. That sounds really weird. I'm not going to abuse him. I'm going <laughs> to use him, though. <laughs> not going to abuse the videographer. I want everyone to know that. But, um, yeah, it's going to be great. I can't wait. October. And it, it, is, it is a cool mission. It's like what I was saying earlier about how maybe uh, shame would have had something to do with it about not wanting to talk about my hearing aids in the beginning of my career. But now, 
I'm I'm 100% committed to. I've had enough people come up to me after shows who are like, you know, my eight-year-old son wears hearing aids, and he was watching you on America's Got Talent, and was like, wow, look, look what he can do. I can do that too. And when I hear stories like that, that really opens my mind to how powerful it can be. So the fact that we're going to college campuses, because college was when I was really kind of trying to come to terms with how I felt about my hearing disability. So that's a really kind of formative aid to get to, to these students at and um, be a positive role model, I guess, and make them laugh. Making them laugh is the number one priority. Well, it's also so much about tolerance. You know, I've learned so much from you. I ask you questions all the time, as mm -hmm. you know, because I own a venue in which everyone needs to hear mm -hmm. in here. And, uh, and you have assistive devices available for everybody now with <laughs> hearing impairment. We also provide an uh, ASL interpreter. It's a big but step. That's huge. That is really... But good for culture. Tell people, you always say this to me, and I, I would love for people to hear from you, is everyone always assumes that because you're deaf, you know ASL. Yeah, is that no, true? I, I wear hearing aids. I'm hard of hearing, and my whole family could hear, so I never really was around deaf people too much. So I don't know any, I know like a bare minimum of ASL, which always makes me feel bad when a deaf person, like capital D, full on deaf, uh, starts signing at me. They'll see the hearing aid, and then they start signing, and I'm like, oh no. And then I just kind of. I don't even know what sign to do. I just kind of like tell them no and start backing away. I got to learn. I took a class. I learned a bit of sign language, but it's like, you know, I didn't use it. So I, you well, don't use it, you like lose it. Well, it's just like any stereotype. We just, we see that you're deaf and we automatically assume, mm -hmm. you know, it's like everybody is different. Yeah. Everybody has a different level of need and a different level of assistance. It's like, it's like we see that you're wearing a Hawaiian shirt, so we assume that you solve crimes. Oh. <laughs> and that would be correct. Some stereotypes are 100% true. You're the next, uh, I forgot. Mag Magna yeah. P.I. Magna P.I. That's, right. when Magna did, that's the nicest light. thing anybody's ever said to me. <laughs> when, when, when did you start wearing the Hawaiian shirts? You know, I feel, <laughs> finally somebody got into the important issues <laughs> around here. <laughs> right. Um, I've been wearing Hawaiian shirts for a solid five or six years now. But you know, the last few months, I feel like I've really started to embrace it. To the point where I was very close to wearing a Hawaiian shirt on Conan. And I ended up going with the suit instead. And I feel like that, that might be what did me in. If I had that Hawaiian shirt on, I feel like my set would have ended with me and the whole crowd doing the conga right out of the studio, <laughs> you know? Uh. But I love wearing... I feel like this is the real me that you're looking at right now, Josh. In a Hawaiian shirt. Wow. I'll tell you one thing. That month-long tour, the phone act tour here to here in October, Hawaiian shirts every <laughs> single day. I don't know if they know that, but Phonak, if you're listening, <laughs> please don't rescind the tour with this new information, but I will be wearing a Hawaiian shirt every single day. I wanted to play a quick quote from your recent set on Conan, if that's okay yeah, with you. Yeah, sure. I don't know if we'll get, will we get flagged? Your on? video will begin in six seconds. I think five they seconds. like your secret as we, safe. Oh, oh see, more more than hey, there I am. That oh, wait, is that's Mark, Mark Wahlberg. Wahlberg. That's Marky Mark. Just, I always get us confused. <laughs> <laughs> unlimited data. We want unlimited entity. Okay, so we're also advertising for Sprint on here, and our internet is slow. Well, it'll come up when it decides to come so up. We can punch it's coming up robots. in nine seconds. Is that. Mark Wahlberg, man, Except making that Transformers money and Sprint money in one go. Okay, so uh, Sprint or at and got an extra oh, ad. Oh, at yeah. Here we go. All right. Let's Great to be here in America. I just moved here. I'm Canadian. You think they're scared because they're Canadian? Or they're yeah, no, but I just moved here it. a few months ago. I, uh, I looked at the current political climate, and I said, now's the time. <laughs> yeah, right. okay. Is it weird watching yourself? Very I just weird, learned yeah. an interesting I've only law. It you know, up until recently, it was illegal for gay men to donate blood in America, it's my which is not thing. cool. That's discrimination. Mm -hmm. But they I changed the law recently yeah, like where gay men like are now allowed too. to donate blood, which is great news. There's just one little caveat. Uh, gay men can now donate blood as long as they haven't had sex in one year. So <laughs> That's even more ridiculous. That's crazy. If you're not having sex for one whole year, that's a lifestyle choice I can't get behind. <laughs> I have no problem getting a blood transfusion from a gay man but I'll be damned if I have loser blood coursing through my veins. <laughs> I feel like that course. line was when they were like, oh, okay, this guy's okay, I can laugh at him. That joke goes on for so long where they're like, I don't want to laugh yet because 
I don't want to be on the wrong side of history if he ends up being a bigot. <laughs> You know, and then at the end, like, oh, okay, he's just insulting people who don't have sex. I can laugh at them. Well, look at that whole opening. Nothing about about being hearing impaired. Well, that's another thing is I often wonder if I start with material that's not hearing aid material c- because you can hear it in my voice a little bit. I wonder if it, I get a little less laughter on those jokes because they're distracted. Like, why does he sound like that? And then they kind of laugh at the joke but they're not fully invested. So it's, uh, it's a struggle that I, especially when I'm doing a shorter set, I'm like, should I just right away be like, I wear a hearing aid so I can get into the other stuff? Yeah. Or do I say, hey, look, I'm funny without talking about it and then go into it. So it's a bit of a psychological game that I, I'm not sure what the answer is yet. It shows you how intolerant people are, though, or how judgmental and stereotypical people are. I mean, they just look at you, they hear you, and they're already making judgments, which is what we do as humans. I yeah, mean, I don't know if I even want to chalk it up to intolerance because I believe humans are mainly good. There's some bad ones, but I think it's just the type of thing where we're easily distracted. It's yeah. like it's like if I That's you were on stage and you were wearing an a eye patch no. and <laughs> what do you say? A bikini. A bikini, yeah. A bikini and an eye patch. And then you just did five minutes without what? mentioning them. I'm not intolerant. I would just be like, what the hell's going on with the bikini and the eye patch? Right. Although I would love that if would, you did a set in a bikini and eye patch without mentioning it once. Would the eye patch also have the Hawaiian shirt theme on of it? Of course, yes. Come on. I'm uh, not a monster. That's so fun. You know what I love? We've traveled a lot together because we do a lot of uh, gigs together. And you're so much fun to be around. You really bring that to the stage. I mean, I don't often get the chance to tell you that, but you know, sitting here hanging with you and listening to you, and mostly everyone I talk to business-wise about you always says the same thing. Yeah. They're like, it's just such a nice, authentic guy. You know? And when you get on stage, you're, you're the same guy. You're not being two different uh, people. That's unusual sometimes. You know, you don't always find that in... Yeah, in yeah. Some, sometimes people are different, or they're like a more kind of exaggerated version of themselves. Yeah. I would like, I think that's my main goal, to try to be 100% myself on stage. I haven't accomplished it yet, but that would be nice. To just walk from the back of the room on stage and feel no difference at all. Just be me, but, but you got to be funnier. Yeah. You got to be funnier on stage. So you just headlined our Claremont, Flappers Claremont Club this past weekend. Yeah. Did anyone recognize you from Conan? I was curious. It's yeah, I had a few people, actually people who came out from America's Got Talent too from last year. Yeah. Oh. I had a blind woman in the front row, a sweet woman. Her name was Kelly. Uh, Hi, Kelly. Hi, Kelly, Shout if out. you're watching or listening. Um, and she she actually saw me in Claremont when I was there last time, which was probably eight or nine months ago, and then saw me on America's Got Talent um, and then came back out. And she felt so... I was doing a lot of crowd work, and I was talking to her. She felt so comfortable with me. She told me her whole life story, which included, like, three of her siblings dying, her dad being in a horrible oh. car. And I'm doing crowd work, like having a good time. And then she told me all this horrible stuff. And I, and I just was like, I'm not going to lie to you, Kelly. I have no way to make that funny. That's <laughs> the most awful stuff I've ever heard of. And that ended up getting a laugh just because it was cathartic because everyone in the room was thinking it. But I do want to say I love those moments when somebody feels comfortable enough with me where in front of a room full of strangers they are revealing these deep, dark things, and I'm like, you know I could do a lot of horrible things with that information, but you feel trust in me that I'm going to handle it appropriately. Like tell it on a podcast? Wow. <laughs> no, I'm It's not like I'm saying, this stupid lady. <laughs> no, 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 she no. was really sweet, and I was really... But yeah, a few people recognized me, and I like when they feel like comfortable, like we have a, a bit of a personal relationship or something. So yeah, it was, uh, it was a fun weekend. In well, I think performers with disabilities, other... Any per any person with a disability feels represented in some way. True, yeah. And a little bit of a community, even if it's a different disability. Especially if you're funny, then they get to feel funny too. It's yeah. awesome. It's a really I wonder cool. in, in my last Conan set I, I said a little joke about how I hate all other disabilities. Yeah. <laughs> I thought disabled people might come after me for that, even though it's a joke, but I, I haven't gotten any backlash. Okay. I, I assume they know I'm, it's I'm joking. It's a joke. There. Yeah. yeah, well, you are a comedian. Yeah, well, that's kind of why I said it, because <laughs> lines like that make me feel like, okay, I'm not going down the motivational speaker road. Oh, you're not? I know you would love that. 
<laughs> not quite yet. The best motivational speakers are the ones that are not trying to be motivational. That's the hard part that you have to wrap around your head is you are already motivational, DJ. Even though you may not think that you are, you are. You're an inspiration to people. You're, you're, I mean, the fact that you performed without your hearing aids to that night, that was, I mean, there are comics who won't perform without their notebook. I mean, you know, <laughs> but you're, you actually were at one of the biggest challenges of your life and you got on stage anyway, that you must really like this. <laughs> you know what? I am a hero. You're right, babe. It's time in for the, me to embrace this. In the comedy world, come on. <laughs> no, but I couldn't not do comedy, so that's the thing. It's a compulsion, so. Yeah. Hearing aids or no hearing aids, I think this is what I would probably be doing. So it doesn't feel too heroic to it me. It was probably more like a TV taping. You just couldn't get that instant feedback from yeah. the audience, yeah. right? You hear that w strange, like, nothing coming from people. It was kind of funny. I had to rely on my vision so much, just seeing, oh, that person's head is moving. That looks like a laugh. <laughs> I see teeth. That must be a smile. <laughs> yeah. Oh. It was cool. It was a really heightened experience. And I try to do crowd work because I like doing that. And then they start talking. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm deaf right now. What am I doing? Sorry, I must move on. We can't talk right now. Could you, could you feel when it was a stronger laugh, even if you couldn't hear? Yeah, and that's another cool thing. There's, there's like a different energy in the room when it's a stronger laugh. And that's, I've always kind of overestimated how much of that is I'm sensing with my hearing. Because even with my hearing aids out, I could still feel it. And that's cool. That's a cool idea that the, the room is kind of a living organism that even without hearing it, you can feel the energy of a, a good joke. That's pretty cool. Nothing uh, will replace live performance ever. I really don't believe it's been going on since the dawn of time and caveman era. And it yeah. really like pe humans performing in front of other humans. It's it's a one of one time only experience. I love it. I love that connection. And if you agree, like us on YouTube right now. <laughs> any any cavemen out there? <laughs> <laughs> I agree, though. There's something special about those magical... Yeah. Um, Live. The, when you go see a show and something happens and you know that happened tonight and that won't be repeated. Yeah. And yeah. we try and capture that on video all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a unique thing. It's just this battle between what we watch on video and what we... We see live. But you can come see DJ live this weekend in Burbank. We backed to backed him around his Conan set. We sandwiched him mm -hmm. in our Claremont Club and then this weekend at our Burbank Club. Yeah. Uh, Friday and Saturday, 8 and 10 o'clock. There's still some tickets, just a few. They're they're going like hotcakes. Are they? Yep. Nice. And um, will I be wearing a Hawaiian shirt? You gotta come out and find out. Phone act called and bought all the tickets. <laughs> 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 they they love you. I um, love them. Also, DJ, it wouldn't mm. be right if we didn't mention your album on... Sirius XM. Yeah, my album, Indistinct Chatter, is on Sirius XM. It was the album of the month on Last Woo! USA in June. Yeah, and that'll be coming out in a few months, too. October. October. Strangely yeah. enough, October is a big month for you. That's right. Yeah, Disability Awareness Month. And your your album coming out and the tour mm -hmm. and it's a lot a lot happening. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I'll just retire after that. <laughs> <laughs> your next performance is actually at our Burbank Comedy Festival after this this weekend. If you mm -hmm. don't catch him this weekend, you'll be appearing in our Burbank Comedy Festival, which is August 13th through 19th. Yeah. Do you know what day your performances are on? I that would be that would be Friday the eighteenth. Oh. Far and away at 8 show. I Nine p.m. Nine p.m. Yes. on Friday. Far August. and away headliners we put you in. Ah, Do nice. you know why? Canada is pretty far and away. That's it. That's Canadians. Right. My home and native land, Canada. <laughs> Did you know that's part of the national anthem? You know any of the Canadian national anthem? No. Please no? sing it for us. Oh Canada, oh, our home, home and native land. land. True patriot love. I'm not singing. In all thy sons' command. Sons' command? Sons' command, yeah. Command. With glowing heart we see. Okay, that's enough. This is going to be a good one to go out on, I think. <laughs> that was very. Uh, I think that's pretty well. True north, strong and free. I'm glad you're a comedian. <laughs> hey, I'm doing a bad voice there. on purpose. I have a beautiful voice. I don't want to brag. I don't want people to know I have too many skills. His voice you know? is right. Right. Just stick with your day job, okay? Yeah. My night job. 
Well, anything else? You have a podcast as well. Yeah, so definitely DJ. When do when can we catch that? It's on iTunes, of course. It's on iTunes, Google Play, any way you listen to a podcast. And uh, I'm 14 episodes deep, and uh, I release it every Friday, and it's been a lot of fun. I think people would enjoy it. I'm, what, I'm having a great time doing it. Is it just you, you and someone else? No, it's me. I have a different guest on every week. Okay. I'll have you on sometime if you'd like. Great. Yeah? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So this is definitely DJ. This is episode 189. 189. Can believe it? Right. Wow. I can't wait till I get to that level. 189. 14. I'm already feeling like, wow, Which, it's building up. Was I wrong on the number? Oh, 180. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. You're lying to me about the number. I don't know what to believe. I think 189 anymore. was the number of Star Trek The Next Generation episodes, actually. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah. That sounds like information that you would absolutely know off right. the top of your and head. And information that I absolutely care nothing about. Uh, <laughs> anyway, well, we, we're running out of time today. Um, but, DJ, it was a pleasure having you here. Um, is there anything else you want to tell people where they can visit you on the web or Twitter and all that? So yeah, my is. name's DJ Demers, and that's D-E-M-E-R-S. You can find me Twitter, Facebook, Demers. Instagram. Demers. Yeah, Demers. That's the French it's way in my home and native land, in all thy son's command. Uh, I don't really know what that means, but every anthem has weird lines that you don't fully understand, right? All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us on another exciting episode of the Flapcast. Uh, Joshua, any last words? Songs in the Key of Funny this Wednesday. Craig Robinson on Monday the 24th. A few tickets left. Kristen Key this weekend in Claremont. Burbank. Kristen Key is amazing. I yeah. love Kristen. Burbank Songs in the Key of Funny podcast she hosts. Uh -huh. And also, don't forget about our Burbank Comedy Festival, August 13th through 19th. You can see comics all day, all night, like for seven days. Get food, get laughs, get a room. Yeah. Is that it? That is. Nice. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. We're out. <laughs>